our next presenter, I have a fellow feeling for because he also works as a journalist. Matthew Carwood grew up on a beef property in Western Australia. He now lives and works in remote northern New South Wales. He's been a journalist for more than 20 years and he's currently working for Fairfax Agricultural Media. And he's going to be speaking to us about agriculture in the uh, anthropocene. Thank you very much. <laughs> Matthew, come and pronounce that correctly. <laughs> I think, I think, I hope it's pronounced Anthropocene, because that's, that's how I'm going to pronounce it. I think it's very, it's, uh, as an inarticulate print journalist, I find it very unfair that I have to follow Brian Walker and Ashley, two very eloquent people. Um, I was going to start with a bit of an introduction to the Anthropocene, but I, to the, to the problems that are afflicting society, but I can see that that's going to be a waste of time. Um, so I'll just share with you a little, a little exercise, a little exercise, excuse me, sorry. I did it at home because we, we all we hear about um, oil forecast in barrels and I've always wondered what a, what a barrel looked like and what all these millions that have been forecast looks like. So I went into my shed and photographed, photographed uh, the field drum that we used to fill up our little tractor and did a bit of photoshopping um, to, to get an idea of what an oil barrel would look like if it was the same diameter as a field drum. And then, then I asked myself, uh, then I looked at the oil forecasts, uh, the global daily, uh, the, the forecast global daily demand for the coming year is in the, in, in the area of a 90 million barrel. It's a bit less than that, but we'll call it 90 million. And so I did a bit of maths. And thought and looked at what those barrels would look like, 90 million barrels would look like, look like lined up side by side. And I had to do the sums a few times because I couldn't quite believe it. it. It means that if we lined up a day's worth of oil consumption, um, they would, these barrels would stretch 1.3 times around the earth. So you can see that humans are incredibly industrious. <laughs> Welcome to the Anthropocene. Um, as I said, other people have given far more sophisticated analysis of, the anth of, of what's happening on the Earth at the moment. But I'd also like to add, uh, we talk about the external effects uh, as without within. Um, the, some of us, uh, researchers have found that some of us carry more than 200 chemicals inside our bodies that weren't there in our, in our grandparents. Um, and these reflect the world we've created. There's fuel molecules, there's molecules from non-stick frying pans, takeaway containers, uh, antibacterial soap. These, these are our environment. These are all parts of our environment, and they're all we are carrying them all around. Anyway, in reference to the Anthropocene, there's a whole there's a lot of lenses to look at it through, but I just want to look at it from the, through the lens of agriculture. And again, I'll be very brief. You know, you'll be familiar with the challenge. Some people estimate that in the next 30 years or, years or so, we need to feed as many people as have existed on the Earth in the, last, in the entire last 8,000 years. Uh, if we continue to do what we're doing, you could only be pessimistic about our chances. But what if we live more frugally? Not perhaps, sorry, I should, perhaps not Bangladesh frugally, but just more frugally in general. What if the world's billion obese gave their excess calorie intake to the, the world's billion hungry? What if we didn't waste 40% of the food that we harvest? We fed much less grain to animals, fertile, fertile farmland was not compromised by development, and what if fertile farmland everywhere produced food to its capacity? Land everywhere produced food to capacity. We could probably put a nice market garden out in the middle of Mount Panorama Racetrack if we were really dedicated to producing food. So I suspect that we're not so much constrained by capacity and know-how as social economic issues. What I'm, what I'm particularly interested in, though, is the other side of the feeding the world equation, which is the environment. 
we can't feed the world at the expense of the environment. The environment isn't something out there that's separate, optional to human well-being. It's us, we're it. You could take away all the shiny things of modern life, cars, jet travel, iPhones, and we could still lead healthy, happy lives. <clears throat> but if we destroy our natural environments, we destroy ourselves. There's a lot of shouting from either end of the political spectrum these days, and um, some of that shouting comes from those advocating for agriculture, some of that comes from those ag advocating for the environment. In the Anthropocene, there isn't a distinction, uh, and obviously there never really was. There's the agricultural environment and there's the wild environment. We actively manage one, we passively influence the other, but we affect it all, the whole lot, and it's all the environment. <coughs> The Japanese have a word which I'm going to severely mispronounce, Satoyama. Satoyama describes a place and an ideal. The place is traditional Japanese farmlands in the foot of the mountains. The farmlands merge into managed forests. The managed forests merge into wild forests. And the ideal is living in nature, taking just enough, uh, living in nature, just taking just enough for a good life. It's not likely that we, we can have the idealised version of Satoyama that's in this Kyoto Journal illustration. And perhaps an Australian version contains 400 horsepower tractors and quad bikes. <laughs> but we do need to ask how far from nature we want to take our farming systems. Because we're all part of those far farming environments. Uh, we're sort of like a living tea bag. We absorb these environments and we expel into them. Each of us is made up of oh, I just got a tweet. Each of us is made up of about 50 trillion cells, 50 trillion living things that form one mostly harmonious community. You hope it's harmonious, anyway. These ch these cells change according to our environment. We now have epidemics of disorders like obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, and these illnesses are at partly or largely caused by our body's confused response to flawed signals coming out of our environment. The relatively new science of epigenetics is discovering that those problems don't die with us. Our bodies can pass on the modifications that they have made in response to those signals onto our, onto our children. So if obesity vanished by Christmas, the condition may be still be encoded in the, next gener in the next generation, and the next generation could pass on that um, that encoding to their, their children. So if we change the environment and the cues it gives us, we change ourselves. This picture was taken in Western Australia in the late 18, 1800s, and I think 1800s, and I think you'd have to agree that it's, it's of a man magnificently shaped by his environment and for it. How do we want to be shaped by our environments? If you had a choice, Oh, what sort of environment do you want to live in anyway? I mean, if you had a choice, which river would you choose to live by? Swim in, fish in. No one lives in damaged environment by choice. The people who live in the world's foul environments usually have no option. On the other hand, we can see areas of urban affluence from space. They're the suburbs with all the trees. I think we can choose the sort of river we want to live by in a metaphorical sense, but we, re we need to rethink about what we want from rivers. I think we can say that people have pretty much fulfilled this biblical injunction handed down to the first man and woman. Only according to some Bible scholars, that word translated as dominion in the original Hebrew meant something closer to wisely managed or wise management, in which case we've got a little way to go. Many, Managing wisely is much more difficult and subtle than just taking charge. And it means a much broader focus than economics, which we have somehow seemed to allow to dominate all that we do. ABC journalist Pitt Courtney is in Sweden at the moment, or I presume she's still there, at the International Federation of Agricultural Journalists Congress. And she tweeted this the other day. It, the, the sentiment will be familiar to farmers in any, development, in any developed country. Let me say that doing the right thing is doing the right thing. Animal welfare and sound environmental management should be a given on any farm. But for a while now, milk has been cheaper than water. And it really is difficult to be green when you're in the red. 
Cheap food only happens when the efficiencies of the factory are applied to the farm, which we've been doing very successfully for many decades now. But that means simplification of farm ecology. Simplification moves farms in the opposite direction to the diversity needed for a healthy environment, or resilience, as Brian Walker pointed out earlier. Farmers find themselves on a treadmill that is always running a little faster than they are. Consumers are telling farmers they value cheap food while costs are rising. Farmers respond by becoming more efficient, taking a few more variables out of their production systems. In short, they become steadily a little more like a factory. Where is this trend taking us? Is it possible to produce food with factory efficiencies on really genuinely biodiverse farm environments? Maybe it is, but maybe not if we persist in only solving problems. Our food system is what it is we kept, because we kept on asking how we could do things differently. We know lots about how. We are much less inclined to ask why. Why is about what we want to create rather than what problems we need to solve. Don't get me wrong, solving problems is good and absolutely necessary. But because so many of the problems we're solving are of our own making, you have to ask whether there's something wrong with the system. Asking why means looking at the whole picture, and the answers probably don't lie, or probably can't be framed within a political cycle, or an ideology, or perhaps even our own lifetimes. Why is, a, is also about meaning, not process. Farmers, farmers aren't any different to anyone else. They want their work to have meaning. That's why they're so often dismayed at how little the rest of society seems to value them. People pay lip service to supporting farmers, but when it comes to getting an adequate return on milk or defending farmland against mining, farmers are out there on their own. Excuse me. Farmers keep on making this rational point. Hey, we feed you. If, if you don't eat, you die. They've been making this point for as long as I've been reading bumper stickers. And <laughs> right now, too many farmers are getting an adequate, in, an adequate return, adequate compensation for their effort. But farming keeps on portraying itself as a business, portraying itself to the public as a business. Businesses on hard times don't get much sympathy. Business is tough, suck it up. While farming is seen as merely a business, it will get treated as merely a business. Another figure in GDP. If it's a business, the community will rightfully, rightly, rightfully haggle for the cheapest food and mining will be a perfectly valid alternative enterprise on land. While it's just a business and not always a very rewarding one, the bush community will grow greyer and greyer. And for as long as farming is just a business, the environment will come second best. Agri agriculture, I think, has to be much driven by a much, much grander vision. I think that, the, that in the Anthropocene, farming has to become bigger than just the business of growing food. If we're going to succeed at feeding humanity without irreparably harming our environment, agriculture must become humanity's expression of wise management. The word farmer has to bear a greater weight. It has to stand for somebody who is a genuine steward of the earth, somebody who feeds us, clothes us, provides timber, energy, from landscapes that are integral to the life support systems of the earth. Not something separate to those systems or even harmful to them, as the case can often be now. We've heard from some of those stewards today. We need a lot more of them. I think farming should be the world's most respected profession. Being a farmer in the Anthropocene should carry the dignity of earning a doctorate that earning a doctorate does today. So how do we get to this rose-tinted vision? Well, I don't think it's about the details. I think if enough people can agree on what farming in the, in the Anthropocene needs to look like, the process will really take care of itself. But it can only be done if, far, if farming reaches far deeper into the community's mind, past the rational surface 
and deep into the irrational part of us. When we believe in the worth of something and that belief is deeply embedded in the body of, of society, we will, support, we will support that something, stand up for it, even fight for it. I don't think I'm flying a kite to think that people might one day venerate really outstanding farms. We can get really attached to buildings and gardens and national parks and we'll picket them to make, ensure that people don't violate them. Right now, I don't see the same loyalty being applied to farms. So I'm asking whether, in the Anthropocene, we can create farming landscapes that other people will love and defend and support the farmers that cultivate those landscapes. It will mean that farmers have to balance the two things fundamental to human existence, food production and the maintenance of vitally healthy environments, and then they have to make other people aware of how important, how hallowed such landscapes should be. This might seem like a wild jump. Oh, sorry, I missed a click. This may seem like a wild jump, but I think we can learn something from medieval cathedrals. Cathedrals must have been almost impossible, impossible to build with the technology of the time. When they did get built, the process took 50, at, at least 50 years, sometimes several hundred years. Many of those cathedrals have now nourished souls for more than a thousand years. They've been burnt, torn down, bombed, but people just keep on rebuilding them. Everything around them, else around them is turned to rubble, but these buildings created out of a belief keep getting rebuilt. I hope we can create landscapes like that. Cathedrals are a beautiful expression of humanity's deep, driving desire for meaning. We all have that desire. In a, in a rational world, we tend to seek it in smaller things like careers and money and iPhone apps. As, and as the marketers know, it's a desire that's never slaked when, you, when we take that approach. I think creating health, abundance and beauty out of the earth in a time when we could much, much more easily destroy it is an expression of meaning worth striving for and one that will last. It's also worth thinking that it's very unlikely that any government would allow gas fracking in a cathedral. <laughs> Thank you.